pay cord. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> All right, we're back, folks. Um, so we are uh, reviewing the the map, the timeline, and we're gonna pick up the timeline now at the seventeenth century. Seventeenth, but more so, we're gonna pick it up on the on the Anabaptist movement. And the reason that is, even though they're not as important to our midterm, is they're a good, perfect segue to Baptists. Um, so the Anabaptists have been, uh, for what we know, the earliest is around 1525, okay? Hundred years later, we have uh, the movement. Thomas. Yeah, we have the movement with John Smith. On okay. oh, John Smith. All right. So, and you notice the mon monarchy timeline disappeared on this chart, which was the monarchy right here. So we simply yeah. replace that. But if you're building your timeline, this actually would be at the very bottom under Anabaptist and then Baptist. And, and your timeline starts at 1600. So you move away the 1500, you move it forward, 1600, you develop another grid. And two particular names are two individuals that, that is so important to our study is uh, John Smith, who went to, yes, yeah, uh, who, who went to, is it Scotland or I forgot now where he went. He went and he left. And then later on found, under his disciple, Thomas Elvis, um, he brought back the movement back to England at 1612. So just a few years later, what is so uh, and you need to understand also who John Smith is and try to understand to the characteristic of Thomas Elvis, which we have a slide on that on lesson, I think, three or lesson three, three pastor. Yeah, lesson three. Lesson three. Yes. Very good. All right. Um, let's move on. And I'm just I'm just going to skip some of this. And there they are. I, I want to go straight to the development of our timeline. One moment. There. So here is a very simple rendering of what happened on the 17th and 1800s, okay? And the timeline that we want to bring about is a very simple timeline. And if you look at this chart right here, do you all see it? Okay. okay. What I've done to simplify everything so it still fits on our grid, the one that we have been looking at, is I put 1600 here and 1700. And you notice I collapsed it to give way to this part of story. And I kept two things. And remember from um, Elvis, from Elvis, uh, the development of Baptist and, uh, and their affinity with uh, Arminianism and uh, Calvinism, which brought two Baptists rather than a united Baptist, the general, meaning that everyone gets saved as Arminian of belief, particular, which is the election, which is a Calvinism. I put that there, and then later on, we're going to populate to see how did the 18th century influence the Baptists, okay? And in this, uh, there, are, there are a few key words that that's hopefully have already resonated with you from, from the 1500 to 1600, 1600 to 1700. By the time we get to 1700, 1800, the three key words I want you to remember is toleration, enlightenment, and awakening or enlightenment slash radical theology. All right. And let me show you how this works. We're going to, you're going to see 1700, 1800. And you notice that the timeline, look at this timeline. It kind of broke apart. Look at this. It's all dots. Can you all see that? Yes. Instead of a stronger line, because really between general Baptist and particular Baptist, this uh, tide of rationalism influenced both movements. And that's why we collapsed that. In other words, what's happening here is also happening down here. 
So this is an impact on two movements. And, uh, and we describe what enlightenment is. And when you get a chance, read through that. We'll go back to enlightenment, develop into rational theology. Enlightenment is the secular approach. Rational theology is the, uh, is the application to the church. What did it do to the church? And later on, you'll find out in this screen, it didn't really do a lot of good things. There's certain effects that have been very devastating, uh, especially to the Baptist faith. Not just the Baptist faith, but um, uh, to all of the dissenters and even the Church of England. Here's another thing I want you to watch. Enlightenment had influenced the religions to rational theology, but in response, God used this situation to bring about the Great Awakening. Okay, and on these slides, we describe what the Great Awakening is and how they were influenced from outside England. Okay, and these are the three individuals that we can highlight as men who promoted. Uh, the gospel through, in this great awakening. And by the way, their influence is not just felt in England, but also in Northern America. Okay. So huge part of Baptist history you need to remember because that's going to show in your midterm. Remember the three names of Reformation? Yes, Pastor. And do you remember the three names on the monarchical triad? Yes. And you have the three names of the Great Awakening. Mm. All right. Hopefully that helps you. No need to peek on your books. <laughs> All right. Moving on. <laughs> so here's the Great Awakening describing the three individuals. And why is the Baptist suspicious of, uh, uh, on them? Um, I, I think I did not put that in the, in the screen. One moment. Hang on. Did I? Did I not? George, I did not. Okay, so here's what you need to know. You need to know uh, why the Great Awakening uh, was a slow movement among the Baptists. You need to know that. Uh, that's under the heading on why Baptists uh, are suspicious about the breakout. All right. But nonetheless... The, the general Baptists were the first ones to be influenced by the Great Awakening. The particular Baptists, theologically wise, were a lot more stronger in their belief. And we've told you already in the past that part of your understanding is that the general Baptists are not made of academic people. They are people of labor. They are laborers that have come to know the Lord and they became pastors. Unlike many of the particular Baptists, they, they have Greek, Hebrew, Latin, French learning. And some of them have hours, if not years, of learning from theology from other people. So when the Great Awakening came, while we say the, the Baptists were suspicious to the movement of the Great Awakening, the general Baptists were, were impacted by the Great Awakening, primarily, all right, primarily, okay. Um, I'll stop there for a while. Any questions? Um, you were saying earlier, Pastor, why Great Awakening was just, is that the, because you said, I oh, remember this, is that the question? Why Great Awakening was suspicious? Or yeah, why you use the key word there is suspicious. When you see the word suspicious, okay. immediately it is only referring to one slide. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and the idea is why, in, in the first place, that kind of spirit is still present in our time today. Mm. Yeah, I just want to let you know, as a Baptist, we're not easily that falls into this, oh, there's a miracle that happened. Oh, somebody said, um, somebody have, uh, saw this great miracle that happened in Puerto Rico. And we were not easily sold into those kind of things. We're suspicious because of our biblical theology. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. By the time we get to the, uh, the next lesson,
Okay. This lesson five. The focus on this is while the, the, the theologies are being developed in the Baptist movement through confessions, all right, we also see some issues going on, the Baptist controversies. The highlight, however, are these two right here. Okay, the foreign mission mm -hmm. and the spread to different lands. So let me discard that and let me show it to you without opening my screen. Okay, can you see a lot of slides? Yes? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so I'm just gonna key into a few things here. So. This lesson starts off with this lesson start, starts off with our uh, familiar timeline, okay? Yes. And then a description of the Great Awakening. Okay. The development of the agencies. Okay, this is, uh, remember those two things that I told you, that's the emphasis, this is that emphasis. And all of a sudden, we've seen a lot of, out of the Great Awakening came about meeting the needs of the community and reaching into the whole world. Okay. What was uh, that again, Pastor? It's, I, I saw Baptist Foreign Mission. Uh huh. And the last one was what? Baptist Global Spread. There you go. All right. Just think of your think of yourself as butter spread, global spread. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Um, so really, these are the golden eras of evangelicalism and missions, should I say? All right. Between seventeen hundred to eighteen hundred, and the and the full blown of it from eighteen hundred to nineteen hundred. Um. On your screen, it says uh, it brings members of different denominations together, right? The impact of it. And uh, it be, and owning the gospel uh, became an became a uh, individual denominations into new ages. It developed, it developed more agencies with distinctive principles and values. Here's a good example. And this example is gonna come to your uh, midterm because I'm gonna ask you, give me an example of a society that was born, that dominated the Baptist movement. And a society, this is not confession, this is not theology, this is mission. That's why they call it missionary society, all right? Uh, so you should be able to say the Baptist missionary society, all right? Okay, a lot of good things came up. What's the example, Pastor? That, that is the example, Baptist oh. Missionary Society. Because you're going to have other names there, like American Baptist uh, Translation. You're going to have uh, King James um, Commission Group. And then you're going to have Baptist Missionary Society. So the, the answer that I'm looking for is this, Baptist Missionary Society. It's, it's the only example that we are using in our, in our okay. history. Okay. So don't put okay. HPBC. <laughs> okay. Um, well, just like any movement, there are those that go for it and there are those that are against mission. Here's what you need to find out. Here's what you need to emphasize. Um, not here and I should probably need to add Okay, now this is a general statement and we're just making this and putting it a quote because it's from me. All right. The, one of the major reasons or the, it's a big reason because it's theological. 
is that the reason why there are particular Baptists that didn't like the idea of Baptists going into all the world is because of the idea that the Great Commission is not for the Baptist. The Great Commission is not for the Baptist. The Great Commission is not for our time. The Great Commission has already been fulfilled, either that or that the Great Commission, God will take care of it with or without our intervention. So the particular Baptist theology is coming in here, the election or the, the, what we call the hyper-Calvinism. And, um, and that's why people are against mission. Okay, God will take care of it. You don't need to participate. You come to the present time, that becomes, uh, that really becomes an, an issue to us today. Why is it that only 20% or maybe less of the Baptists are involved in mission and 80% are not? So you got you to gotta underscore that, the relationship of that to us. Okay. Uh, other controversies came about. I, I trust that you would study your slides on that. But when the Baptist foreign mission, which is the fourth emphasis, third emphasis, I'm sorry, the third emphasis of 1800 to 1700 to 1900, 1800, I'm sorry, 1700 to 1800, you've got men like William Carey, who um, is, is one of our crucial example for missions. Okay, and we describe who he is. We also added David Livingstone. Uh, you got to know that. And should I say without any apologies that women are also part in mission? Okay, because I only have women in this class right now. <laughs> I better say that. <laughs> okay, moving on. The global spread. Okay, and all of these are in your slides, so just go over them. Uh, when we say global spread, what we mean by that is from England to beyond. And remember, um, from England to beyond, it, the migration have gone to different places. There are national contributions. Uh, these are simply observations, but they're going to come out as a multiple choice for you. So review the slides. And by the way, most of our no, actually, everything that we're, we're everything that we are going to go through our midterm this Thursday are all on the slides. Okay, they're all on the slides. Uh, there are national contributions, and uh, don't don't worry about the details of it. There's nothing to memorize here. It, the question will be very very general. So if you know if you know these three slides and and what it means, okay. Um, Which tree is that, Pastor? <laughs> Oh. From uh, England to North America to Latin America to and the last slide. Okay, back to Europe. So there are tremendous contributions of Bap Baptist mission in different places. Okay, and then we kind of concluded that with basic ideas of why the spread happened. And then I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Okay, let me move on. To the last and only lesson. Oh, Marion, you missed this lesson. This is lesson six. Okay, so here's, you all can yeah, see my yes, screen? Pastor. Okay. As always, every lesson we start with the basic map, with the basic timeline. And again, what are the keys to the basic timeline? Uh, the years, the years, the six grids, the triad, triad developments from reformers puritanism separatism all right we'll skip the anabaptist on our our last timeline we removed the monarchical timeline and we replaced that with baptist we put two names on it namely who are they john smith and is that the one i uh, say it again smith and and helswee helwis 
Thomas Elvis. Elvis, yes. All right, those, those are two names that that's going to come to your... So I introduced you. So what we did was we extracted 15 to 16, and then we moved the, the bar forward to 1,600. And here's how it, how it showed. And this is what it showed a while ago with this line, kind of broken. It's a broken line because the Great Awakening is, did not only impact particular Baptists, but it impacted Baptists mm -hmm. in a big deal. So normally that timeline starts with this, okay? And we, we looked at, by this time, there was also a problem with the Baptist. While, while the Great Awakening uh, had a good impact, there were also indications of the Baptist decline. And you got to realize and understand, Baptists were suspicious about what's going on. So they too suffered consequences rather than being productive. And what are those? These are the indications of that Baptist decline. Look at them on your, on your PowerPoint. And then we, we also talked about, uh, we put that in a map. We said Arianism was an issue. And I'm going to ask you the question, what is Arianism? Multiple choice. And then not only Arianism was a problem, it was uh, Socianism was a problem under the movement Socianus. Okay? And I'm going to ask you multiple choice, what is Socianism? All right. Then... Okay. Then we introduce you to two individuals, not significant in our midterm, but good for your learning. Two individuals that, that really rifted, that really destroyed uh, the, Bap the General Baptist movement because they introduced an extreme view of Arianism and Socianism to the point where some of these general Baptist churches, and notice it's back again, general in particular, some of these general Baptist churches did not believe that Jesus is God. Hmm. And they were Baptist? <laughs> yes. You got to understand the theological warfare. Yeah. Let me explain it this way. When there is a new phenomena that happens in the land, some are mysterious, unexplainable, some are miraculous, and we do not have a further explanation to it. Whether you like it or not, it does impact convictions and theology mm. because everyone's trying to put this in their theology. This is why we have the health and wealth gospel, the preaching that, oh, God wants you to be rich and God wants you to be healthy, right? We know that's not biblical. What's biblical is God's going to take care of you whether you're healthy or wealthy, right? God's going to bring you to some good pasture land, but it doesn't mean that you'll be like Job and Job eventually lost everything, you know. Um, in other words, the health and the wealth is not a basis to spirituality. But look at what happened to us now, right? A lot of our uh, evangelical movements have sold into the prosperity gospel, what they call it, because it's the fad, it's the trend. You look at, Mega churches that preaches this from um, the Texas guy. What is his name? Um, um, and then yeah. when you go to Singapore, all, all the, Joseph Prince. Joseph Prince preaches. He's a Singapore. big deal. The black guy. Uh, what is his name? T.J. T.J. Max. T.J. No. T.D. T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes and the Texas guy, and then from to Florida. You've got all of these prominent preachers. You put them in one. they all so attractive. But when you look at their gospel, they're so skewed because it doesn't bring, it doesn't go back to the biblical viewpoint that health and wealth and prosperity is not the basis of your spirituality. But to them, it had become. So that's what I'm just trying to say. Anytime there is a mysterious, miraculous that, that, that is happening as a trend, it does challenge your conviction and your theologies. And so what happens in, in, the, um, in the 1600s, the general Baptists embraced Caffeinites, Caf which is simply an, a moving away from biblical orthodoxy. Okay. And then... Um, is that important for our class? Well, it's good for, for your learning. It's, it's not going to come on Okay. Your, yeah. Okay. Uh, but who's going to come on 
on your um, midterm is this guy named John and Charles Wesley. Their contribution to call back the General Baptist or the Baptist back back to um, revival. John and Charles Wesley. Okay, so you have the triad on the Great Awakening, but you have the you have what would I call them? I will call them. They're the holiness movement. So the idea is a lot more, the idea is a lot more respective of practical holiness. And John and Charles Wesley should come up. Okay. Uh, here's what they thought. And that's why they're important. And the fact that they have been very innovative makes them a really good Baptist. Because Baptists are innovative when it comes to um, bringing the gospel to different places. Okay. But it says earlier on the other screen, Pastor, it says they're Methodist. Uh huh. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're talking about influence. They're, okay. When we mention their names, it doesn't mean they're from, but rather they have influence. Just as Calvin, Zwingli, they're, these are non Baptists. These are, these are priests mm -hmm. or for the yeah. mind of us, right? And yet from them, they have highly influenced our theology. Mm -hmm. So okay. all of these people that we're using are doing the same. And when we come to, and that's why there's what we call the revival manifestations. That's the holiness movement right there. Mm -hmm. um, when we come to particular Baptist, we bring down the discussion down to the bottom line of our timeline. And we see also they suffered. Not only the general Baptist suffered, all right? They also suffered. And there are eight characteristics that we mentioned on how they suffered. Look at that on your notes, okay? Uh, no need to memorize. As long as you understand, you're a Baptist, so you know what you believe, right? As long as you know <laughs> your theology, it's a lot easy to answer what got lost from there, okay? Um, like, for example, this. They didn't want to, they had nothing to do with reaching the needs of the people, had nothing to do with outreach evangelism too. And those are the kind of things that got lost in the particular Baptist. Okay, moving on. Um, not only the eight characteristic, but another theology that crept in. Like, while Kathy Knights was a problem with general Baptist, hyper-Calvinism was a problem with particular Baptist. They're going to come up on the theology uh, midterm class? Yes, of course. <laughs> Yes. Then it's going to ask you to describe hyper-Calvinism because you need to know that. These three names are not particular, but they're good for our learning. They're the ones that popularize. Just as you have Matthew Caffin and William Vidler on the, on, the general, on the general Baptist that populated these wrong doctrines, you have also Chris Husley and Skep and Brian who popularized hyper-Calvinism. Really, really... Uh, uh, put the particular Baptist into their knees. And, the, and this one, you need to remember. Which okay. one, Pastor? I just highlighted this name. You see it? Okay, okay. What is his name? John, John Gill. John Gill. In what area do we have to remember him? When we Hyper mention what? Hyper-Calvinism. Hyper That's right. Okay. Now, why is he so important? Because John Gill... As influential as he is, will influence a man named Andrew Fuller, who will play a big, big role in consolidating missions to uh, the world. Andrew Fuller is the same guy who held the associ associational meeting in Northingham Association. He gathered 64 uh, Baptist churches, and William Carey was part of that meeting. William Carey was asked to preach at that time. And Andrew Fuller dismissed the meeting without any next steps to take. And William Carey put Andrew Fuller on the side and said, Mr. Fuller, um, are you not going to do again anything? We know between that conversation sparked the modern missions from which we attribute to William Carey. So you see the connection of the successions from John Gill to Andrew Fuller, Andrew Fuller to William Carey. Baptist history in the making right there. Okay. Which is why 
we put William Carey on our slides. So mm -hmm. it's going to come out like this. You've got John Gill. And then you've got Andrew Fuller. Can you see my cursor? Yes. 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 Okay. And then William Carey. So all three of those. Another triad you have to remember when it comes to modern mission from hyper Calvinism to modern mission. All right. Hyper Calvinism to modern mission. So who's the triad pastor? So is it John Gill, yep. Andrew Fuller, and uh, William Carey? That's right. Yes. Not Abraham Booth, right? Well, Abraham Booth and Andrew Fuller are together. I didn't want oh, okay. to emphasize him so much because he's going to come to our one, one of our future lessons. But uh, he's not as important, significant on what we're trying to learn at this time. Pastor, okay. when you yes. said uh, modern Calvinism, when you say modern, is that a, like a recently or? No, no, we, we say hyper Calvinism. Calvinism. Hyper. Yeah. So mm -hmm. this, you see this word hypo Calvinism right there? Yeah. Yeah. So that's the issue among particular Baptists. On the mm -hmm. general Baptist, the issue was uh, Socinism and Arianism. The particular Baptist issue us hyper Calvinism. Remember that that's gonna come in your midterm. Okay. So the Southern Bap pastor, where where does it fall? Is it the general or the particular? That is the paper that Randy Beltran is going to write about. I am excited to find out his findings, mm. right? Uh, because the Southern Baptist is neither in my own opinion, is neither. Well, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Theology-wise, they are. Practice-wise, we're neither. Uh, because uh -huh. we are a full, mature representation of the general in particular. In other words, when the movement was start starting, they had their flaws. But as mm -hmm. they mature, we see them in the body of the Southern Baptist Convention. And mm -hmm. mind you, uh -huh. South SBC is not perfect too. We have our own hiccups too. Slavery, yeah. equal genderism, uh, egalitarianism, um, you know, all, all ecumenism, all of these, we have our own problems too. So, but not to say, if you ask me, are we general Baptist or particular Baptist? I would say neither and yes. <laughs> uh -huh. But I'm excited to see uh, Randy's. Uh, um, Southern Baptist didn't come up till what, 18 something? Right, right. So 1840s is when we were born. Like 1845 or something like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So here's the last one, which I told you in the last uh, recording that Baptist Missionary Society was a good example. And now it appears on our timeline. Right. Because it was not until Andrew Fuller and William Carey first ventured out. By the way, missionary societies were already going out. Mm -hmm. It was the Baptists that were more concerned about. They were just not reaching out. Mm -hmm. and it was not until William Carey had this really pointed situation with Andrew Fuller, who had 64 churches in his association meeting and didn't do anything. Sounds like um, associations that I know around the areas here. Ouch. They keep on meeting and do nothing. Oh, oh, oh don't take me on that one. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> okay, moving on. Where are we at? Uh, that would be lesson six. And that's, Marianne, that's the lesson that you missed. Okay. All right. And then we stop. Okay, folks. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to stop the recording. Review, keep on reviewing your slides and uh, have fun in your midterms. Uh, ladies, say bye-bye to the recording. Bye-bye. Thank you, Paul.